This is Entertainment for Review, and I'm going to be continuing the Friday the 13th review series with 1982's Friday the 13th Part 3 or Friday the 13th 3D. Because this movie followed another 80s trend, which was to put some of their movies in 3D, and in a lot of cases it ended up being the Part 3. Other examples of this were Jaws 3 and Amityville 3. In my opinion, this doesn't really add anything to the film, but they were just trying to do something interesting. So let's jump right in and take a look at Friday the 13th Part 3. And as always, please be aware that if you haven't seen this movie, that this review will be containing spoilers. Now this movie starts off with a recap of the ending of part two. And it just replays the final scene up until the point where Ginny and Paul leave Jason. But it's here that we get a deviation from the end of part two, because it shows Jason remove the machete from his shoulder and then crawl away. However, at the ending of part two, when Jason leaped through the window to grab Jenny, he still had the machete in his shoulder. The timeline for this movie is slightly confusing to me. It's supposed to take place the day after Friday the 13th part two as an immediate follow-up and continuation. But we start out at a country store owned by two people, Harold and Edna. And it is evening. On the news, Edna hears the reports of the murders found at the camp. And they note Jenny as a survivor was taken to the local hospital. It shows her being taken away from the scene at the end of part two, which was the following morning, you would think. But it almost seems like this scene is supposed to be the same night. Jason shows up and is stalking around the outside of their store, although he has undergone some physical transformations. We see him walking past some laundry, and he is still wearing the same overalls and shirt from the first movie. And he's not wearing anything over his face, and he is still deformed, but he does look different. They've decided to go back to a bald look for him here. And like I said, his face is still deformed. It just looks different than it did at the end of part two when they showed it. Jason kills both shop owners, first Harold with a meat cleaver to the chest, and then Edna to the back of the head with one of her own sewing needles. And he does steal a new pair of clothes. Next, we're introduced to our new crop of teenagers for this movie. And it's a little bit different because this time it's not a group of camp counselors or counselors in training who are on their way to the lake for a weekend of fun. And they are headed to a private property along Camp Crystal Lake called Higgins Haven, which is owned by the family of one of the members of this group, which is Chris. The others that make up this group are Debbie, Andy, Shelly, the group funny guy, one of these movies always seem to need one of those, and there's also Chuck, Chili, and Vera. When they get to Higgins Haven, they're also joined by Rick, who is Chris's boyfriend, who is already there ahead of them. So different, but still largely a group of teenagers who are choosing to go to the wrong lake. On their way, we see them pass the store that Harold and Edna were killed at, and we see the police there and the body bags being removed. And we get something else that's a little bit different, and yet not, because as we know, Crazy Ralph was killed in the previous movie, so he's not here to give his warning to this new group of teenagers. But somebody else is. As they're making their way towards the lake, they see an old man sleeping in the road, and they go to check on him. This old man's name is Abel, and he is holding an eyeball that he says he found, and is giving them a warning of doom of his own. So as we said, different, yet not so different. As they get to Higgins Haven and begin to settle in, Chris seems to be seeing small things around her, such as looking out the window and seeing the barn door open. She's outside and hears a scream and runs inside and has a look around. She opens up dresser and out falls Shelly with a hatchet in his forehead. Everybody else gathers around thinking he's dead, except for Andy, who's Shelly's roommate, so he's used to his pranks, and he tickles him, waking Shelly up, revealing that it's just a prank. However, this one seems to have gone a little bit too far, and everybody in the group is a little frustrated about it, and everybody kind of splits off in their own directions. Vera decides to go into town to get some time away and taking some pity on him she takes Shelly with her. While they're at the store they have a run in with a couple of bikers who give them a bit of a hard time and when they're leaving Shelly accidentally backs into their motorcycles. One of the bikers was outside and sees this happen and takes the chain and breaks the windshield and the window on the car that they're driving which happens to be Rick's car. Shelly's a little fed up with it and at this point circles back and runs over his motorcycle with the car. They get back to the cabin and Rick's a little upset at the state of his car and of course he would be. But Chris tries to calm him down. Andy and Debbie decide to go for a swim and then we see that the bikers have made their way to the cabin somehow following them there to get a little bit of revenge for their bikes. And they have a pretty simple plan which seems to be to steal gas from their van and use that to burn down the barn. However they came to the wrong location to try to seek out this revenge and they are all taken out one by one as they enter the barn. Fox is stabbed through the neck with a pitchfork when loco goes looking for her he's stabbed through the stomach with a pitchfork and when ali comes in he is bludgeoned over the head by jason next chris is out in the woods with rick having a conversation and she recounts her story of what happened to her two years ago where it seems she had an experience with jason at that time she says after she had a fight with her parents she went out into the woods and she fell asleep she woke up to some sounds and then a grotesquely defigured man with a knife attacked her she says the last thing she remembers is being dragged away but when she 
she woke up, she was back in her own bed. If this story and this encounter are true, it does pose an interesting question, and that's that why does Jason let some of his victims live? When he leapt out of the lake at the beginning of part one and grabbed Alice, he didn't kill her, although he did come back for her later. And after grabbing Ginny through the window at the end of part two, he also did not kill her. It seems that's also true in this case for Chris and her first encounter with him. So there is a bit of a trend going with that. Next, after Chuck takes a visit to the outhouse and gets a little spooked, he thinks he sees Shelly going into the barn, and so him and Chili go out to investigate the barn. And that seems to be a strategy Jason's employing here to draw people into this barn. And it's working quite successfully. At this point, they do manage to avoid a run-in with Jason and make their way back to the house. Now, Vera had gone off on her own earlier, needing some time away, and she's sitting out by the dock. And in an effort to get her attention, Shelly decides to play another prank on her and grabs her foot from underneath the water in the lake. When he emerges, Shelly actually does something very important for the entire series, and that's that he introduces the hockey mask. When he comes up out of the lake, he is wearing a hockey mask and a wetsuit, and he has a spear gun. Vera's a little frustrated. Shelly just can't seem to figure out quite how to talk to her and engage with her in a way that will work. So he leaves her at the dock and then wanders back up towards the house. He then too sees something around the barn and goes to investigate and goes in and Shelly finds his end here as Jason kills him off screen. We then do get our first images of Jason in the hockey mask. <laughs> he has taken the hockey mask and the spear gun and goes back down to the dock where Vera is in the water trying to retrieve Shelly's wallet that she dropped in. First she thinks it's Shelly coming back but then realizes it's not but it's too late. Jason shoots her through the eye with a spear gun and I must say he's a pretty good shot. He has pretty good accuracy for someone who almost guaranteedly has never used a spear gun before. Jason then apparently has decided it's time to kick things into high gear and start going on the hunt instead of waiting for people to come to him in the barn. He makes his way into the house and while Debbie is in the shower and he's walking around at a handstand and he walks right up to Jason who uses a machete to cut him nearly in half. Debbie goes back to their room and she's sitting on her hammock reading a magazine when some blood drips down and then she sees that Andy's body is on the rafter up above her. Then Jason grabs her head and brings the machete up through the hammock through her body. This is actually a callback to the original movie as this is the same type of kill that took out Kevin Bacon's character Jack in the first movie. Jason then makes his way down to the basement and kills the electricity. This draws Chuck down there to check it out. While he's down there investigating, Shelly wanders into the kitchen with Chili. His throat's been cut, so we didn't see the attack on him, but we do get to see his death. Jason then in the basement kills Chuck by throwing him into the electrical panel, electrocuting him. Then goes upstairs in pursuit of Chili, who's a little bit panicked after realizing that Shelly's really dead and not just playing another prank. She runs upstairs and finds more dead bodies, heads back down, only to have Jason waiting ready with a hot fire poker to stab her straight through the body. Next, Chris and Rick finally make it back to the cabin and notice something odd right away. It's a little too quiet. They go into the kitchen and find some burnt popcorn, and Rick notices that nobody else is around. He goes outside to have a look. When Chris comes out to try to join him, though, she can't find him as Jason is restraining him behind a wall, and as soon as she goes back inside, he kills him barehanded by crushing his head between his hands. And that is an example of how they've already started to begin Jason's march towards becoming a juggernaut. That is quite the feat of strength that I don't think his part two predecessor would have been able to accomplish. Chris is now the only one left of the group, so naturally she has to do what happens to a lot of them in this situation in the movie. She starts looking around, finding weird things, and even starts to run the gamut of dead bodies. She's scared, and she's running around, and she's really calling out for Rick to come and help her, and then his body comes flying through the living room window. To be quickly followed up by Jason coming in, wielding an axe. And as we've seen in the previous films, there's always this heroine who's the only one who seems to be able to have any success in combat with the killer of the film, be it Mrs. Voorhees in the original or Jason in part two and three. She runs upstairs and hides only to find another dead body, but that gives her a weapon that she pulls from the body and uses it to get land a blow on Jason's leg. She then goes outside and waits for him. When he emerges, she hits him again and then manages to get into the van and start to make an escape. However, due to the bikers earlier, the van runs out of gas and she's stuck on a bridge. And in this process, the van breaks through the bridge and the tire gets stuck. All this gave Jason time to catch up to her and she ends up having to abandon the van to try to make another escape and ends up going into the barn which as we've seen in this movie so far is not a good place for anyone to be. She tries to bar the door but Jason's able to get it open then he comes in and reseals the door himself. They then do battle around the barn which includes Chris dive bombing Jason and luring him up to the hayloft. She manages to get him down enough to put a rope around his neck and throw him out of the hayloft trying to hang him. 
Little does she know, he has an unbreakable neck, and when she goes down and opens the door, he's just sitting there waiting for her hanging, and then pulls himself off the rope. He also reveals his face to her in this moment, revealing that he remembers her, and she remembers that he was the deformed man that attacked her in the woods two years prior. Jason then moves in for an attack, and is temporarily distracted by Ali, who is still alive from his earlier bludgeoning. However, he doesn't last very long, as Jason now chops him up with a machete. However, this distraction does give Chris enough time to grab an axe, and when Jason stands up and turns around, she lands a heavy blow to Jason with the axe to the head through his hockey mask. She then follows in the footsteps of Alice from part one, and thinking things are over, she goes down to the lake and gets in a canoe and just goes out into the middle of the lake and falls asleep. In the morning, she wakes up and has a look around. She gets startled a few times, and then she looks up to the house and sees Jason staring at her down from one of the windows. She grabs an oar and attempts to start paddling away, as Jason breaks out the door and starts running down towards her. However, when she looks back, Jason is gone and the door is back to its normal state state. However, we do then get another surprise moment, and that's that Mrs. Voorhees jumps out of the lake. She's regained her head, although she still looks very dead and dried out, and she is covered in leeches, and she grabs Chris and drags her into the lake. So the same shock as the first movie, but in reverse. But did this actually happen, is then we next see Chris being led out of the house by the police. They say she's the sole survivor what's gone around, and she's in a state of shock. They say she was talking about a woman in the lake, but they don't think it was real. They lead her to a police car, and she does seem to be a little bit hysterical and gone a little bit crazy. But who can blame her after what she's just been through? And as the police car drives away, we then get a shot of Jason still in the barn, laying with the axe in his head. And finally, a closing shot of the lake. And we do see some air bubbles surface, perhaps showing that something is hiding beneath the surface. Part 3 in this series always holds a special place for me. I remember once as a kid renting a VHS copy of it from Blockbuster and watching that movie on a loop for an entire day. For me, it's a very important movie in the series. If for nothing else, is that it gives Jason his look and gives him that hockey mask that becomes so iconic. And speaking of look, they definitely did, as we said before, change up Jason's look in this movie. He still is deformed, but his deformity is a little bit different. His face is still deformed and misshapen, but not quite as bad as it was in part two when they showed his face. Also decided to take away his hair and make him completely bald. And I think that the reason they did this is for the aesthetic of the hockey mask. This version of Jason looks much better wearing the mask than he would have looked if it had been the Friday the 13th part two version of Jason. And this movie does have a lot of similarities to the others in the series, but it at least did try to be a little bit different. It's still about a group of young people being murdered in the woods by a deranged killer. And if you think about it, Jason had been quite busy. He gets a total of 12 kills in this movie, including Harold and Eden at the store. He kills Fox and Loco in the barn. He gets Andy, Debbie, Chuck, and Chili in the house. He had also attacked Shelly in the barn, but Shelly wandered into the house and died. He kills Rick outside. And finally, Ali out in the barn again. But since this movie was supposed to take place merely a day after the second movie, in a two-day period, Jason gets 22 kills. Now, there are some awkward parts to this movie that are just because they tried to film it for 3D. You can see a lot of moments where they were just trying to do something that would make something pop off the screen in a 3D theater. And it just creates some awkward on-screen moments that don't add anything to the story. And we do continue the trend of having a surviving heroine who then gets a shocking surprise moment, but one that doesn't lead to their deaths. And this one even left you wondering if this was just all in Chris's head. And we're left with no confirmation that Jason's even still alive. But apparently these Voorheeses are built different, you can't keep them down. This movie was not too well received. It got only a 7% score, giving it a rotten score on the tomato meter from critics, and a 42% score from audiences. And over on IMDb, it got an audience score of 5.6 out of 10. Maybe I'm nostalgic, and maybe I just like these movies a little too much, but I think that this score is a little too low. It may be a little rushed, but they turned out three of these movies in three years' time. And they do use a similar formula for each one, but I think they turn out a good product. That is pretty entertaining. My personal score for this movie is a 7.5 out of 10. I think this movie deserves bonus points, just based on the fact that it brings the hockey mask into play. Let me know your thoughts on Friday the 13th Part 3 in the comments section. Like it or don't, I'd like to hear. Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel and keep an eye out for my next video coming soon, which will be Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter. Although we all know it is far from the final chapter.